think uh, the rarest thing when you listen to the radio or, or watch uh, television is to be uh, surprised. And, and uh, by that I mean for somebody to, 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 to actually uh, give a new thought, give you a new thought, a new way where, where you can actually think like, okay, I had never really pictured things that way. And especially rare is what I think of as, as a sort of happy, pleasurable surprise. And in, in public radio, the, the, uh, I, I worked for, for all the daily news shows at, in public radio before I, I started this, this show that I do now. And, and there's kind of a tradition of this. And I'm going to play you a clip just from a, like a hard news story. This particular one takes place in a, in a frozen uh, wasteland. So what this story was, was um, the Axon Valdez was this uh, huge tanker. You may remember uh, hundreds of millions of gallons of oil spilled over Prince William Sound. And this story is from the third day of this oil spill. And the reporter is Danny Zwerdling. And what's going on on the third day, the actual news, this, this is the lead. The oil spill is the lead story on kind of every network in the country and lead news story in the newspapers. And on the third day, um, what scientists were trying to do was figure out the damage to the various critters uh, and all in Prince William Sound. And this is part of the story that, that we filed. Alice Berkner, director of the center, said earlier today she expects rescue teams to start flying in dozens of animals, mostly birds, sometime today. And they'll feed them through stomach tubes, clean their nostrils, and in some cases, bathe them. It's a series of baths in uh, hot water. It's a solution of Dawn dishwashing liquid. Dawn dishwashing liquid? That's correct. You're going to get letters from Ivory and the, the other companies. Yeah, I hate to sound like an advertisement, but Dawn is uh, the best soap for the job. I've tested just about everything out there. And Dawn seems to remove the most commonly encountered polluting oils. It rinses out of the feathers very well, which is extremely important because if you leave any detergent residue in the feathers, the bird won't waterproof up. Huh. So we have been sticking with Dawn. I'm, I'm open to suggestion on a lot of <laughs> areas about bird care, but I won't, I won't allow any substitutes with Dawn. Now, you can, um, you can make a kind of news case for that piece of tape uh, in the lead story of a news show. And, and the news case would go like, OK, we're there. We're documenting what happens when, when, you know, when a big ecological disaster happens. But really, the reason why it's there is because Danny and I just thought it was really, really funny. And um, I, I, think, I think people don't talk enough about, about, um, about uh, just, the, just the importance of, of in, in a context like a news show, uh, people taking pleasure in their work. Uh, I feel like moments like this, you can hear how excited Danny is that he's getting this quote. She kind of dangles it, you know, it's a series of baths, Dawn dishwashing liquid, and it's like he, he pounces on her. He's so excited. And you can hear him actually cackling in the background, like laughing at her as she's giving him the thing that sounds like a, like a commercial for this soap. And um, I, I feel like that, that kind of thing just isn't, isn't uh, present enough in, in the news. Generally, the aesthetics of the news in our country are that there's that the serious and the funny are never allowed to collide as if they were to touch. It would be like matter and antimatter on the old Star Trek or something. Um, where, where, where generally, like in a newscast, the aesthetics are it's like serious story, serious story, serious story, serious story. And at the end, there'll be the, like, the wacky weather person or the wacky um, sports guy with the blooper reel. And, 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 and they're sort of kept separate. And I feel like it's such a failure of uh, craft. You know, like, like, like there's a sort of a, there's a kind of a fake gravitas that's sold in the aesthetics of the news. Like if you imagine uh, like Sam Donaldson or somebody like, like laughing the way that Danny is and going like, oh my God, I never thought of that. Like his head would blow off, you know? <laughs> like, like it's, just not, it's just not what he does. And I, I feel like that, that's a failure of craft. I feel like part of um, the job of journalism is, 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 you know, it's the part of the media that's supposed to be documenting what, what the world really is. And, um, and, and, and most broadcast news through a kind of accident of aesthetics, the world that they describe is a world utterly without uh, surprise and, and joy and pleasure and, and humor. That, that is, most broadcast journalism makes the world seem much smaller than it is. And by, by making stories whose aesthetic is surprise, which is very much what our show is, making stories that are constantly saying, look how different this is than you would think. Like, look how interesting this is. Like, look how much more interesting this is than you would think it. And, and constantly searching for stories where there'll be like little surprises all the way through, all along. What that's doing is that it, it's reasserting that the world 
the, it's reasserting the world to its proper size. You know, it's reasserting that the world is a place where surprise and pleasure and joy and humor exist. It, it makes things hopeful, you know. And, um, and this is my problem with, with most uh, radio and, and television uh, news is that they make the world seem less interesting than they are. I mean, of course, uh, the, the funny moment is often the most, most revealing as well. To find the, the, the stories on our show, generally, we, we, to find three or four stories for any given week's show, we'll go through as many as 15 or 20 stories and, uh, and uh, look at them, research them, and then probably go into production on six to eight of those stories. And by production, I mean, you know, people do interviews, I do interviews, we set out writers writing, we, we start, uh, we, we actually like put thing, put fly people around the country, and then we'll kill between a half and a third of those stories. And, uh, and, and the idea is that, that since we need stories whose aesthetics are all about surprise, we're, we're, trying to, we're trying to basically create a context where lightning can strike. We've got to try enough things so that surprise has a chance to kind of make it in the door. Um, and a lot of the things that turn out to be the most, the most um, uh, useful for us are things that are, I think, useless in other contexts. Uh, in, a, in a way, like all of the, all this kind of journalism, like that kind of moment from Danny and the other things, it's like applying the tools of journalism to things that would traditionally be considered so small. Um, a couple of months after the, the, the war on uh, terror began, uh, after, after uh, the World Trade Center was bombed, we did, we did a show where, uh, where the entire show was on an aircraft carrier that was, uh, that was uh, flying missions over uh, Afghanistan, this is back when the United States was still simply fighting enemies who had actually done something to us. And, uh, and, so, and so we're fighting the Taliban and, uh, and, uh, and this aircraft carrier is flying missions over Afghanistan. And uh, this is, th this, is this uh, aircraft carrier where, where kind of every news organization went, went to this at some point or another, CNBC and CNN and MTV News and, and uh, the USS Stennis. And they, they tended at that point in the war on terror to do very, very corny uh, kinds of, of uh, stories, like flags would be snapping in the breeze and deep voice narrators talking about these brave men and women going in harm's way, which we were actually fighting uh, Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, neither of which had uh, an air force or a navy. So actually an aircraft carrier turned out to be a rather safe place to be, uh, as the people on the aircraft carrier would tell you. And, and we started our show with, with uh, th this, uh, uh, with this uh, one sailor uh, name of uh, Cree Von Scott, uh, her, her mission in the war on terror. My name is Cree Von Scott, um, just filling up the vending machines. Is that your, is that your, your, your full-time job? Yes. It's your full-time job? Yeah. Filling up vending machines all day <laughs> for 12 hours. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Krivan. So, I mean, I've always said it's, it's sort of like one thing to fly halfway around the world to shoot, uh, you know, bullets at bad guys, and it's another to to fill vending machines with Snickers bars for your country. What are the big sellers? I'm um, like, right now it's Snickers and Starburst. Snickers goes real fast. What's the least favorite candy on, on board? Bonkers, the fruit chews. We got boxes of those and still have them. <laughs> Sometimes if we don't have anything else, we'll just put it all rolls of bonkers and they'll still stay in here. Some people hate bonkers. They just nobody likes bonkers. We still got them, but we've been ordering a whole lot of new stuff, so I've been trying to keep like a whole variety of things in here. Like Crunch and Munch, we just got the Crunch and Munch and the Cheez-Its we normally didn't have in here. Cheez-Its? Yeah, the Cheez-Its, the different kind of Cheez-Its. Yeah, so we put this, say what you will, when it came to, um, the, our cheese at supply lines, we totally had the Taliban beat. Um, so, so, so we put this on the air and we sort of held our breaths because it was so contrary to, to what anybody else was doing. It was, it was the single funniest hour on the war on terror anybody was doing uh, in March of uh, 2002. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and we were flooded with emails actually from, from Navy guys saying, that's right, that's exactly what it's like. And, and in general, I think, I think uh, what we're trying to do and is, is portray people at exactly human scale. Um, so, the other thing about our show is is uh, is that is that there's there's a there's a uh, structure to the stories that's a particular structure that that I'm going to talk about because it's it's easy to learn, and and I believe it's the most effective way to communicate uh, over the radio certainly, but also in certain other uh, contexts. Um, one of the things we know about our, our audience is that 1.7 million people l listen to us each week on the radio and a quarter million people listen to our podcast. We're the most popular podcast in the country. And, um, and, and from the audience numbers, we know that, that for our 59-minute show, the average listening time is 48 minutes. 
um, which means that pretty much anybody who turns on the show stays with us, you know, since it's the average, you, no matter when you turn on, like, if you turn on the show at any given point, you stay with us till the end, and if you've ever turned off the show in the middle, you don't exist statistically. Um, <laughs> and so, um, and I think the reason why is because of, uh, partly because of, uh, partly because of our taste, actually, the things that we find interesting. I think that, that I and my co-producers were just pretty normal, like raised in the suburbs kids with pretty normal taste. And if something is interesting to us, uh, it tends, I think it, it just translates to a lot of people. Uh, but then the other part is that the stories are structured in a way to constantly be throwing bait and pulling you forward. Uh, to demonstrate this, I'm going to just play you the opening of a show and just mix it the, the way it would on the radio. Okay, so, so this is, I'll just stop and start this as we go. Okay, so, um, so Joel worked at this office where every now and then the office manager would bring her nine-year-old to work. Good kid, kind of tomboyish. And she would just kind of help out around the office. She would pass mail out. And over the, over the time that I was there, she and I developed this really, this kind of teasing relationship. She would come into my office and she would drop my mail off and stick her tongue out at me and I would sort of fake chase her down the hallway or something and, you know. That's sweet. Um, yeah, yeah, she's an incredibly sweet kid. And so there's this day when, uh, it's early in the morning, I've arrived at the office and, uh, and I go into the bathroom um, and when I come out of the bathroom, I have my glasses in my shirt pocket rather than on my head. And I look down this hallway and I see um, this small person walking towards me. And I then um, get down and start to crab walk towards her. So I, so I sort of go down on my haunches and, um, and put my hands up as if they're claws and kind of waddle, waddle towards her. Okay, um, at this point nobody turns off the radio. But why? <laughs> like seriously, like why? If, if you think about the actual fact pattern of this story, this is actually not that interesting of a story. Do you know what I mean? Like, there's a, like I'll tell you the story. There's a guy in his office and he comes out of the bathroom one day and goofs around as he goes down the hall. Like it's not actually interesting. And yet suspense has been created. Why? How does that happen? Well, well the way it happens is built around the, the fact that it feels like something is about to occur. And the reason that it feels this way actually gets to the very heart of, of what a story is and how we're built to in, in, engage with a story. Um, in, in its most basic form, uh, a, a story is really just a sequence of actions. And literally a sequence like this thing leads to this next thing, leads to this next thing, leads to this next thing. It's not about logic. It's not about argument. It's about motion. It's not about reason in any way. And, and the way that we're built is that if we hear any sequence of actions uh, begin and take motion, no matter, no matter how simple, really, um, you know, there's a guy, there's a little kid at the office, uh, he comes out of the bathroom, glasses in his pocket, you know, starts goofing around down the hall. It's like we can feel the accumulation of events, one leading to the next, that it's heading somewhere. It's like, a, it's like a train leaving the station, and we can tell it has a destination. And also, the events themselves are raising a question. Narrative is basically a machine that's raising questions and answering them. And obviously, like, like one of the things is like, what's going to happen next? is the question, but then the other is, is the glasses in the pocket are sort of the clue to the whole, the whole puzzle, which you, can, which you can tell in an instant. Um, knowing, knowing how to manipulate that, how to handle that, I think is the beginning to actually knowing how to tell a story. Um, one of the differences between our show and the other shows on the public radio is, the, is that the other shows will start their show with a list of what's coming up on their program, which I feel like is, is a, a sort of singularly uninteresting way to start something. Um, actually, actually, on our, on our show, we will just start the action going. We'll, like, I feel like if we can draw you into the dream of it, you'll be inside it before you can even think about why you're inside it or what it is. And it, it's far more irresistible. Um, and, and then you're there in the middle of this thing, this, this, in a way, like a kind of useless story sometimes. But you can't get out. You have to find out what's going to happen next. Um, all right, back to the story. You remember where we are? He's waddling down the hall, hands like crabs. And as I'm waddling towards her, I say in this kind of creepy voice, oh no, I can't believe you're here today. <laughs> and then at that moment, as, as I say, today, she comes into focus. And I realize, in fact, it's not at all the young girl who I thought it was, but it's in fact one of our interns, a business intern who, uh, uh, who is a, a, a midget. <laughs> And 
so she comes into focus and I see her and I'm horrified and I go bolt upright and I stand up and I say, oh my, my God, I'm terribly sorry. I, 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 I thought you were somebody else. And I think to myself, who could she possibly think that somebody else is? <laughs> and I wonder at the time, should I have tried to explain it to her? And it seems to me like one of those situations where it only gets worse the more you try to explain it. The only thing I could do was in fact, apologize and then end all contact with her forever, right there. <laughs> So Joe says the woman was utterly gracious. She introduces herself. She tries to put him at ease. Apparently, if you're a midget, this happens once a week. Um, but even today, you know, years after this happens, when he thinks about this moment, he, he cringes. He cringes. He actually has a physical reaction. You know, there's something ab about that moment. You, you know what I mean? Like maybe you're at the office, maybe you're at a party, maybe you're out with friends. You're talking, you're laughing, you're on a roll. You are the party. And then you look in the mirror, you catch a glimpse of yourself in the mirror and you realize you are an ass. You know what I mean? Like we have all been there and, and what do you do? You, and you cringe, I've thought about this a bit, like the cringe is so particular. Like if you think about like, well what are the physical reactions that we have to our emotions? Okay, well there's, there's laughing, there's, there's crying and there's cringing, like it's in the top five, you know what I mean, cringing. And I think what it is is that, I think that, that what's going on with the cringe is that the cringe is the human body cowering in fear for an instant, you know? And, and I think what is happening in those moments is that, is that as people, we are confronting something very frightening, which is that we're confronting the thought that we are not who we think we are, right? That the world sees us differently than we see ourselves. And not in the good way. Okay. Stop. All right, you are a machine and I am a man. It's, it's locked itself in a way that resists all unlocking. That's fascinating. And also very poor timing on its part. All right, I will unplug it that way. Because I am a man. Um, so um, this is the other kind of thing you need in this, in this structure of, of story. If you imagine Joel's uh, story with just the action part, you know what I mean? There's a guy, he's at the office, he comes out of the bathroom, goofs around, realizes it's a midget, and flees. Like, that's the action. The action stops there. It's not as satisfying. It's not as satisfying if you don't go on to, like, well, what's the bigger universal something that this moment is an example of? You know, like, what's the bigger thing that this is? And, and it's like, why is this moment so powerful? Why is it when we, un when we hear that, that it still makes him feel terrible years later, why is it we all understand that? Like, what's the bigger universal something? And, and in this kind of storytelling, what you want is you want, you want a sequence of actions and then you want some sort of thought. You want to gesture at what is the universal something uh, that, that's going on there. And, and I came to this uh, totally through trial and error, actually. I was a tape cutter at, um, at NPR in Washington. And, uh, and I would just notice in the interviews that I was cutting for the news shows, there would be certain stretches of them that would be totally mesmerizing and I would feel every feeling and every, it just would just, and the funny parts were funny and the emotional parts were emotional. Every time I would play in these certain stretches of the interviews that I was editing and the rest were just like questions and answers, questions and answers. But in these stretches, it was just like, what is this? And, and what it turned out to be is they were stories with this structure, action, 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 and then some thought periodically thrown throughout about what the action was. And I thought to myself, well, can you, can you game that? Do you know what I mean? Can you game that? Can you basically do away with all the useful trappings of journalism, like uh, timeliness and the news and big issues and everything else, and focus just on this feeling that I'm getting from this? And, and, and it turns out you can game it. You I basically would go out and do interviews with people, would have them tell me stories, and then periodically I would just ask, so what'd you make of that? And then, um, and then I would edit myself out of the thing completely and put together their answers into these little uh, portraits. And if I understood how to restart this, in some way, then I could play you an example of that. But actually, I'm down at the bottom of my time. Can I take, can I take five minutes more? Would it be, okay, since I'm your very last speaker. Um, the, the other thing I think I, I would talk about uh, in this time is, 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 um, is w what are stories for? You know, like, what are they, like, what are they good for? Um, and uh, hey, it restarted. I do know enough about the iPod. Um, 
And, and to, to answer that, I want to describe a production of, of The Arabian Nights that I saw a couple of years ago. A woman named Mary Zimmerman uh, directed this. She's a, a director out of Chicago. She won the MacArthur Genius Grant. And, and when you see her work, you can really see why she would win the Genius Grant. She, um, she does these, these plays that are just uh, completely affecting emotionally and really, really funny and really accessible and just, just like, beautiful. And, uh, and uh, so, so uh, actually, her work is here in New York quite a bit and in Chicago quite a bit. And so she put up a production of The Arabian Nights. And you probably remember the plot of The Arabian Nights from high school, if you went to high school in Baghdad. Um, <laughs> There, there's a king, he marries this girl, and he, and he loves this girl. He just loves her, loves her, just like loves her with all, all, everything in him, you know. And, 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 uh, and she betrays him. In, in some versions of the story, um, she sleeps with one man, and in some versions, she sleeps with many men. And, and he goes mad. He, he kills her, kills the men, takes a sword, kills them, blood everywhere. And then after that, every night, at, at, uh, when night falls, he marries a, a different girl, goes to bed with her, and then in the morning has her killed so that she can never betray him. So this goes for, on for day upon day and week upon week and month upon month. And finally, one day he goes to his wazir, his advisor, and says, like, OK, who's, who's the girl today? And his uh, wazir says, oh, my king, there, there's not going to be a, a girl today. Uh, all the young women in the kingdom, either, either you've killed them or their parents have heard what's going on at the palace, and they've taken their daughters out of the kingdom. And the king. Um, thinks on this a minute, and he, and he says, you know, you know that, is, that is not exactly true. You have two daughters, Dunyazad and Scheherazade. Bring me your older daughter. Bring me Scheherazade tonight. And his wazir drops to his knees and, and, and begs for mercy. And, uh, and the king, crazy, will hear none of this. And, and, and the wazir reminds him of his loyal years of service to the king and, and the campaigns they've fought together and all they've been through together. And, and, the king, again, mad, will hear none of this. And the wazir bows even lower and, and reminds him how their families have, have always known each other, going back generations, and how his family has always been in service to the king's family. And can he once, for once, make an exception? The king sends him off. From the moment that, that Scheherazade shows up in the story, She's such a, an amazing character. She's such an amazing character. She, 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 like her, the, first, the first words, basically, that she has in, in the Arabian Nights are, um, are pretty much, yeah, I thought this was going to happen. <laughs> Don't worry, Dad. I have a plan. She's very, um, she's very uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer season three, <laughs> if you know what I'm saying. Here's her plan. E every night. Uh, well, for, she, she marries the king. She goes to bed with him. And that night, she starts to tell him a little story later. You know, this thing happened, and it led to this next thing, and it led to this next thing, and it led to this next thing. And dawn comes. And the king can feel the motion of the story. It's like, it's like a train that's leaving the station. They're neither trains nor stations have been invented. He can feel that she's going somewhere with this accretion of events, and so he lets her live. Next night, go to bed, she picks up the story where she left off, and again, one thing leads to the next, and that leads to the next, and that leads to the next, and oh my king, I think this part of the story will be of great interest to you. And again, dawn comes, and again, he just, he can feel it's going somewhere, and he wants to know where it's going, and again, he lets her live. And it's such like a beautiful thought in a way that you could save your life a thousand times by suspense, you know? That's not the most interesting part of, of the Arabian Nights, though. One of the things about the Arabian Nights is that there's no standard text of it. It's not like the books of the Bible and, you know, these books are in and these books are apocrypha. Uh, basically, there's, there's like a bunch of stories that you use when you make your thousand and one nights, you know? And, um, and you know, there's Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves, and there's Aladdin, and many fine Disney movies from these stories. And, um, and, and basically, you just pick and choose your favorites when you want to tell your Thousand and One Nights. And, and in Mary Zimmerman's stage adaptation of it, every story that she chose for Scheherazade to tell the king, every story reiterates what's going on between Scheherazade and the king. And so there are stories about the question, can women be trusted? 
They're stories about uh, people who have love offered to them, but they can't see that love is being offered to them, and they turn their back on love. And in all the stories that Scheherazade tells the king where somebody turns their back on love that's freely offered, that person is crushed. There's stories that um, people who have gone temporarily mad. One of my favorites is there's a story about this king, and really he's just, like a, he's just like a tremendously overworked person who's not being nice to his kids and to the people who work with him and just whatever, for a certain kind of person easy to relate to. And he knows that he's gone mad, and he goes to his wazir and he says, I know, I know I'm not acting right. I know that I'm mad. I know that I'm not treating people right. What do I do? And his wazir says, oh, my king, then let us go to the madhouse. Because everybody knows that the mad often have moments of piercing insight. And perhaps one will have such a moment of insight for you, which, of course, one does. And then, and then there's one story after another where someone is sitting in judgment on someone else, on whether or not they're going to live or die. And those stories are invariably told from the point of view who might die. Three men come to a crossroads, and there's a genie at the crossroads. And the genie says, each of you men will tell me a joke. And the one who tells the best joke will be allowed to live and will cross this bridge, and the other two will die. And then each man nervously tells his joke. And you feel for those guys, man. <laughs> So, after 100 nights, and 200 nights, and 300 nights, and 400 nights, and 1,000 nights, you know, 1,000 nights of rehearsing empathy, you know, of practicing empathy with these fictional characters, the king discovers that he's not crazy anymore. He discovers that he's capable of, of empathy. And, and the way this is signaled in the Arabian Nights is, is quite pretty and always the same is that on the thousand and first night, when Scheherazade is finishing her story, the king, out of the blue, unbidden, says to her, you know, I've been thinking. You gotta go to your father. I've been thinking, your father, your father must be worried sick for you. Your father must think that, that any day, uh, I'm gonna kill you. And you gotta go to him, you gotta, you gotta tell him, I'm okay. It's going to be okay. And, and then Scheherazade um, lets him know that she's pregnant with his child. I think, I think what it's about, uh, among other things, this story, is that it's about the power of narrative. How, how narrative itself, it, it's like a back door into a very deep place inside of us. And, and a place where, where reason doesn't necessarily hold sway. And you know, like all of us, like, like and, and when a story gets inside of us, it makes, it less, it makes us less crazy. Like I, I, like I think about, I think about, uh, about, about just uh, there have been so many stories in the news, you know, about, like, I don't know, Al-Qaeda, where until you actually hear the story of somebody who actually joins Al-Qaeda and you can understand their experience, I feel like until that moment, you don't even understand what, what you're talking about. Like, there has to be a person's story that you hear where finally you get a picture in your head of this is what it would be like to be that person. Or this is what it's going on in Baghdad right now. Like, this is what it would be to be that person, that soldier in Baghdad. This is the situation right now. This is why if I were a Sunni, I would hate the Shia and vice versa. Like, until that moment, you're, you're, you know nothing. And, 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 and everything about you as a person deals with the information that you're given in a flawed way. And like we, all of us in this room, like we live in a very peculiar uh, cultural moment where, where we're bombarded by more narrative than any people who have ever lived. I, I can't remember the playwright who said this, but somebody said that, that we're the first people, the, the last generation or two, we're the first people who've ever lived who can see actors on a daily basis perform. You know? Like, like and, and I, th I think for us, it's even, it's even more so. You know, like every story on the on the on the web is is a is a narrative. You know, like every every ad is a narrative. Every every everything on television, of course, is a narrative. Every um, you know, every song is a narrative. Like it's narrative, narrative, narrative all day long. And and speaking for myself, I have to say the thing that characterizes most of those stories is that is that they're yelling at us a little bit. That they're yelling at us and trying to get our attention and trying to pierce through all the noise of the narrative. And 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 because they're yelling that often gives them, a, like, not just a shrillness, but a, a, a falseness. That, that, they're having to that they're having to sort of sell us the story. Like, 
we just started doing doing our show as a show on television. And one of the things about stories about real people on television is that the people are never exactly human scale. That either they're like specimens, they're like little bugs on, on slides that are used to illustrate like big social principles or something that's happening in the news, or they're like or they're props in a fake drama on a reality show. And no knock against that, I love those shows, but still. Like it's not, it, it, there, there's a, there has to be an entire apparatus built up. Um, and, and, and one of the rarest things is to actually enca encounter somebody in, in a story around us in this bombardment of stories to encounter something where you can actually feel, oh my God, that's exactly what it would be like to be, to be that person, to actually be able to imagine yourself as that person. It's just in incredibly rare. And when it happens, you totally notice. And it can happen in the oddest places. There's a, there's a television show that, that my wife has me watching now that has exactly the same plot every single week, beat for beat. And when you go to the first commercial break, it's the same. When you go to the second commercial break, it's the same. When you go to the third commercial break, it's the same. It's this TV show called House. Have you seen this? And, um, and I don't understand why she watches it. Except, I mean, I do understand. And the reason why is because there's something in the attitude of that actor who plays that doctor that seems so real to both of us, that simply like watching somebody inhabit that attitude, which seems real, is enough to make us sit through the biggest crap of, of storytelling that ever there was. Do you know what I mean? Like it's just completely contrived as a, as a show that you would watch again and again. But, but there's something actually human alive in it because of him in a way that you almost never see. Like, like it ha when it happens, it's rare and you notice. And, and I think it's important. I think it's, I think it's rare and I think it's important to do and, and that's why we try to do it on our show. Those are my thoughts. Eric Glass.